Professor Clements with you as we wrap up Chapter 27 of OpenStax College Physics, talking today about resolution, thin films, and polarization. And uh, this material does relate to what we've been doing with the uh, wave interference. In uh, the topic of resolution, we'll be discussing how much detail we can see in an image with a telescope or with our eye. Uh, then secondly, thin film interference. We'll try to understand what causes colors that we see in soap bubbles or oil slicks along the gutter. Uh, and then polarization. How do Polaroid sunglasses block glare? And how does your LCD display work on your calculator or your, your television? Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about resolution first. We've uh, seen in recently that uh, light does diffract when it goes through a single slit. When light encounters a circular opening, diffraction also occurs. Even though you know a mirror or a lens is a circular shape, not a, a, a parallel set of lines that form an opening, we still have a diffraction effect that occurs. It's a little bit different than the effect of the single slit, a different equation. That's always fun. Um, but it does cause a problem with us being able to focus uh, images of closely spaced objects. Things that are uh, close to each other are going to blur together because of their central maxima will blur together. So here's a graph of intensity versus sine of theta. This is the ordinary uh, parallel uh, set of lines forming a single slit. And we get the uh, minima located at these spots where we have the destructive interference from the light across the single slit, the single opening. Um, here is the same or similar graph, but now plotted for a circular opening. And a couple things have changed here. The previous graph had sine of theta going off to the right. This graph is just going to deal with theta. Uh, the angle is going to be small, and the angle is approximately equal to the sine of the angle for the case of small angles. The angle you're using now is the radian. The radian. This theta is not in degrees. This theta is in radians. You must be careful of that. So we have, a uh, again, an interference pattern located here, bright intensity in the central max. The first minimum occurs not at lambda over d, but at 1.22 lambda over d. 1.22 lambda over d. d is the diameter of your circular opening or the mirror. Uh, so slightly different than the uh, uh, equation we use for the single slit, but we will calculate our angle of resolution theta using 1.2 lambda over d, and we'll talk more about that. So here we have two light bulbs. Each of them is going to create a central maximum, and these light bulbs would be detected as separate objects. Their central maxima are far enough apart. Well, what is far enough? Far enough means it satisfies the Rayleigh criterion. The Rayleigh criterion. And we see here the central max of one of the objects is located at the first minimum of the other object. Same thing's occurring if you switch objects here. Object 2 has its central max at this location which is at the same location as the minimum of object 1 in its diffraction pattern. When this is the case, we can resolve the image. We can see the separate objects that form our image. So this Rayleigh criterion, a little different diagram here, uh, we're just barely resolved when this occurs. So I'd like you to look through these A, B, C, and D. Uh, which of these diagrams would you say is barely resolved, and which is best resolved? Which would it be easiest to see two separate objects? Which would we just barely be able to detect? There are two objects present. And even which one would you not be detectable of that there are two objects? You would think there just been one object. So barely resolved, we can start doing this at B. This is a little bit borderline, but uh, this peak is almost at this first minimum. It's a little bit better here. We see a definite dip of the intensity between the two objects. So I, on a test, if I presented this diagram to you, I won't. But B or C, I would accept as OK answers 
you'd not really given enough information. If someone would tell you that this central max is located at the first minimum of the other diffraction pattern, then B would be the choice. Um, that is the Rayleigh criterion. Um, best resolved down here in D, as these peaks are further apart, the central max are further apart from each other, we more easily resolve the object into two separate objects. And not resolved at all will be A. There's too much overlap of the uh, intensities to, to give this, uh, to distinguish the separate objects. So the Rayleigh criterion, we want the central max of, for one of the objects, its diffraction pattern, to fall at the location of the first minimum of the other diffraction pattern, the other object's diffraction pattern. So here's some photographs of this. Uh, here there are two objects emitting light. They're too much overlap. We don't see them as separate objects. Here they are well separated, you know, well enough. Uh, we would see them as separate objects. And here, just barely starting to be resolved, we would probably not say that they're resolved. Uh, not quite enough separation of the light to uh, indicate that. So here's an Earth-based view of a galaxy, M82. And with not a very large telescope, but an Earth-based view, and not a very modern telescope, it's an old photograph. Here's the Hubble photograph of the same area, the same galaxy. These two objects are identical. And you can see the bright star that's uh, to the lower right of each uh, in this galaxy. Um, so which one has the best resolution? Which one's best able to see details? Uh, not too much of a challenge here. The Hubble telescope does give us nice, clear, resolved images over a wide field of view, over a wide area of the sky. There are ways, again, I've mentioned this in class when we talked about telescopes, adaptive optics will let astronomers make detailed photographs from an Earth-based telescope, but of a smaller region of the sky than the Hubble telescope can uh, work with. But better resolution here, and one factor for the Hubble telescope, it is fairly big mirror, 94 and a half inches in diameter. This could have been captured with someone's amateur telescope, maybe six inches in diameter. But a bigger problem on the Earth is the atmosphere. The twinkling effect of the Earth's atmosphere blurs out details. Okay, here's another uh, telescope, space telescope photograph. Uh, the Hubble telescope, as you see in the credits. And we're looking here at a globular cluster. This is a collection of stars held together by its own gravity. Over 100,000 stars in this cluster. Why, if you started counting here, I have not counted. I'm very confident there's a fewer than 100,000 points of light on this photograph. There are over 100,000 stars here. Astronomers know that because they can determine the mass of this globular cluster. And we know the average mass of a star. So why is it there are fewer than 100,000? Uh, if I kind of move my uh, picture down here somehow, some way. Why is it that there are fewer than 100,000 points of light in the, uh, in the photograph? And try to get back up here. Well, you should be saying because some of the stars are not resolved. Some of the stars are too close to each other. There's fewer than 100,000 points of light in this uh, photograph. Some of the stars are too close together on the sky. And you can see that in here, this, uh, these bundles of light. There are really thousands of stars in each of these bundle points of, uh, of light. Further out from the center of the globular cluster, the stars are far enough apart, the Hubble telescope can resolve those separate stars. The maxima of their diffraction patterns uh, fall at each other's minimum, they are resolved by the Rayleigh criterion. Uh, radio telescopes have a harder problem in resolving objects. Uh, if you uh, just remember glancing at the equation earlier, 1.22 lambda over d gives us the angle to the first minimum, but that angle depends on the wavelength. Radio telescopes use radio waves that are much, much longer wavelength than visible light. Uh, so consequently, uh, radio telescopes have poor resolution as a single telescope. It's partly the reason they try to make them large to help the resolution, partly to gather enough energy. Uh, but there are other ways radio astronomers do have some tricks that they can 
uh, help create resolution. We're not going to go into that. So thin film interference, our next topic. Uh, thin films like a, a soap bubble or a layer of oil on top of water. Um, this thin film has a top and a bottom surface to the medium. Uh, the air, then the medium, and then some other medium. And light can reflect from the top surface and the bottom surface and come back to a person's eye that's looking down on an oil slick in a gutter or looking at a soap bubble. We can get reflection from two surfaces. We're going to have the opportunity for constructive and destructive interference. You know, peaks arriving with peaks from two beams of light from the two reflections or a peak in a valley arriving from the two beams of uh, the two reflections. There's um, a principle, an understanding that will help us solve these problems. There is not a formula that we're going to use to calculate uh, whether we have constructive or destructive interference. You need to understand the principles. Those principles are based on how thick the film is. That will give us a path length inside the, uh, the medium, the film, the film of oil on top of uh, water, for example. Uh, the thickness is important as the uh, wave travels in that film of oil. There is a phase change occurring due to the distance. Then the index of refractions for both the film and where's, what's on top, what's below the film, this thin film. That's important in our analysis. And the wavelength of light is important to determine how much distance we need to go from peak to valley or peak to peak. So here's a photograph of soap bubbles. You can see the colors. They shimmer and they shimmer because the uh, soap bubble is changing thickness as it water evaporates from it and uh, water is moving around. So the wall changes thickness. That's going to change what color has constructive interference and gives us the brilliant color. Oh, here we have the uh, working diagram for how do we analyze whether we have constructive interference or destructive interference. So let's take a look at the rules here. Um, so we have rule number one, or consideration number one to uh, think about. This light is coming in. Let's say this is air. And let's say this is oil. Um, the air is our first medium. The oil is our second medium. Light is going to reflect from the top. You'll need to know the index of refraction for the different media that are here. So let's say the air is 1. Let's say the oil is 1.4. Um, in this situation, we have the light starting in a, a medium um, that has a low index of refraction. And here's a higher index of refraction. Now that's the wording that's in this sentence, although I just see the wording I've created here is not the best. But uh, we're, our light's reflecting off of a medium that has higher index of refraction. We're reflecting off of medium 2 for this ray number 1. We're reflecting off of medium 2. And if it's oil 1.4 for index of refraction, where the ray started, 1.0 in air, there's a higher index of refraction of here. It's a hard bounce. And it turns out that there's immediately a half wavelength phase shift for the light as it bounces back. If we have a peak arriving here, it leaves as a valley instantaneously. Um, this is a little bit of an example. If you tie a rope to a wall and shake that rope, a peak comes into the wall, but a valley leaves the wall. It's, it's not quite identical, but it's similar. So if we have a more de optically dense medium that we're bouncing off of, then there is a half wavelength phase shift. We're con going to consider constructive or destructive interference by what is the phase relationship of beam 2 compared to beam 1. If it's a half wavelength out of phase when we do all these rules th at the eye, then we are going to have destructive interference and a, uh, a dim spot or that color not seen. If we have peak and peak arriving, because somehow we've had a combination that produces a full wavelength of phase change for beam 2, then we'll have constructive interference and we'll see that color. Another thing you'll have to be careful with in the analysis, looking at the example problems, there's a new wavelength inside medium 2 compared to in the air. We know the speed of light slows down as we go into a medium. We know that the frequency stays the same. So speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. Frequency is constant. 
speed of light is slower, the wavelength must be lower. And the wavelength is lower by a factor of the index of refraction. So you will have to calculate a new wavelength in the material. If you're given the wavelength in air, you must calculate a new wavelength to use inside the material. And that will be the wavelength in air divided by the index of refraction. So then we have another bounce down here. Uh, make, let's make this run 1.3 for its index of refraction. Here's 1.4. So we're coming in, medium is 1.4, we're bouncing off a softer, quote unquote, optical medium here, 1.3 for its index of refraction. We started in 1.4, here's 1.3. Is this a case of rule number one? No, we're bouncing off a medium that has a lower index of refraction. There is no phase shift as we reflect. So this is the way it works, it's real. Um, is challenging, you have to memorize. When you bounce off of a higher index of refraction material, there's immediately a half wavelength phase shift. If we're bouncing off a material that's not higher, then we don't have a half wavelength phase shift. So we'll combine that with the uh, how many wavelengths, half wavelength or quarter wavelength we have for the thickness of our, our thin film. That's going to be one of our primary targets of calculation. How thick is the film that causes a certain color to be missing? But we'll have to analyze, have to consider, do we have a half wavelength phase shift or not for each of these bounces? Do we have a full wavelength of path of this lambda prime wavelength, not just lambda, but lambda prime distance in here? Or is it half of lambda prime uh, for the total path? We'll have to consider that. We'll use our brain, we put all those, inf those facts together, and we decide if we have constructive or destructive interference. Another example of this, we're not going to do calculations like this, but we can introduce phase change if there's an air gap, a little wedge of air, and we'll have some demos in class of uh, things like this. Um, but there is phase change going on here, beam one, beam two, you're looking at your eye down on this, and you will see colors. Certain wavelengths will have constructive interference, certain wavelengths will have destructive interference. Uh, Newton's rings, where we get a more circular effect here, if there's a spherical piece of glass resting on a flat piece of glass, um, there'll be an example of this passed around class as, as well. So Newton's rings, but we're getting constructive and destructive interference. Bright band where you have constructive interference, dark band destructive interference uh, because of these phase changes. Okay, last section, polarization, polarization. If you're wearing Polaroid sunglasses, you'll view this uh, stream bed on the right. All the glare has been removed. Over on the left, you're just uh, ordinarily viewing the stream bed and we're getting a lot of glare. You can see the cloud reflecting in the, uh, in the light here. Light that reflects off of a surface becomes polarized. If you wear Polaroid sunglasses, those Polaroid sunglasses are built to remove the polarized light, to remove the glare and revealing more uh, below the surface. So how's this work? Well, we need to talk about polarization. Our electromagnetic waves have oscillating electric and magnetic fields. That's what light is. If this light is randomly polarized, there are many waves in a beam of light from a flashlight or the sun or something. There are many waves and we're going to have all sorts of orientations of the electric and the magnetic fields. They're going to be oscillating in all directions. That's random polarized polarization or just not polarized light uh, would be another way, legal way to describe it. If we are polarized, linearly polarized, then the electromagnetic waves, there's only one direction that the electric field oscillates in, only one direction in the magnetic field oscillates in. These two fields are still perpendicular to each other as we studied. But with polarized light, we don't have random direction of oscillation. There is one fixed direction of oscillation for the electric field and thus for the magnetic field. So here would be a drawing of this. Electric field oscillating up and down, magnetic field side to side, the speed of light, this is our velocity of direction. We're just going to talk about the electric field for the direction of polarization. So this would be a vertical polarization of the, uh, of the light. Here's randomly polarized light, many waves, many electric fields in all sorts of direction, unpolarized light. 
If our light is polarized, think of a rope, a wave on a rope, and a vertical slit or a fence, picket fence, and the rope's tied on the other side. We can shake the rope up and down and it'll go through. However, if we shake side to side, if we make the direction of polarization, polarization horizontal, and our filter, our fence, is vertical, then the rope is going to slap against the sides of this wall, lose its energy, and we'll have no amplitude on the other side of this filter. This would be a polarization filter example. So this is what we get to study polaroids. In actual polaroid material that works with light, there are very long partially conducting molecules in the polaroid material. Very long molecules that are uh, partially conducting. As the electric field comes through here and is oscillating, if the electric field is vibrating horizontally here, that is going to push electrons. There will be a force on the electron, F equals QE, F equals QE. So the electric field will do work on those electrons. Well, if it's doing work, it's using up energy from the light. The energy of the electric field is used up pushing the electron back and forth here. There's going to be resistance in this molecule. It warms up a little bit. Uh, not a problem in how much it changes temperature, but uh, for most light sources. But we're going to use up the electric field in this direction. If the electric field is vibrating up and down, there's essentially insulating material between these conducting molecules, and the electron doesn't have much uh, space to travel in. There's not much work in this uh, vertical direction. So this would be a Polaroid material. Um, again, if the electric field is vibrating in a direction along the long molecule, energy will be removed. You can see a lower amplitude for the, uh, for the light as it moves to this side of the uh, Polaroid filter. If the electric field is vibrating up and down, then not much energy is lost. The electron is not going a big distance. The electron is going the width of the molecule. So we don't lose much energy in that situation, and we don't polarize the light. So now that we understand that, let's talk about the axis of a Polaroid filter. This axis is the direction the electric field gets through. What's the direction of the long molecule? The long molecules are perpendicular to this. This direction of the electric field in this unpolarized light, that electric field has been removed, and only the direction perpendicular to the long molecules gets through. So this axis is not the direction of the long molecules. The axis of the Polaroid filter is not the direction of the long molecules. So that's our Polaroid, and we can turn two Polaroids in different directions, and we can reduce the intensity of the light that comes through. Um, we can even block any light from getting through. If the Polaroids are oriented 90 degrees to each other, no light comes through the two Polaroid combination. If the Polaroids are oriented by 90 degrees, no light comes through. Um, if we just turn a little bit, uh, we don't have theta of 90 degrees, but we just have some angle in between 0 and 90 degrees, then we lose some intensity, and we calculate that by the intensity coming into the, the second filter uh, that's here. And we have some first filter that creates polarized light. Um, but the intensity that comes into that second filter multiplied by the square of the cosine of the angle uh, between the two directions of polarization. That gives us a calculation of how much intensity comes out of this second filter. Very often we'll talk about two filters. One filter that creates a polarized light, a second filter at some angle compared to the first one for its axis. We calculate the intensity out of that second filter by how many units of intensity we have coming in, cosine squared of the angle. And doing this calculation on your calculator, maybe it's uh, 20 degrees, let's say, is the angle between the axes of the two filters. If it's 20 degrees, first you take cosine of 20 degrees, then you square that result, then you multiply it by this intensity. You do not take the square of 20 degrees and then activate your cosine calculation on your calculator. Take the cosine of 20 degrees, square that result, multiply by the intensity coming into that uh, filter. A little animation here. Um, LCD computer monitor or your calculator has an LCD screen. 
So try turning a Polaroid in front of that uh, LCD screen and you'll see that the LCD has polarized light and when we're turning so it becomes dark the theta is 90 degrees cosine of 90 is 0 cosine squared of 90 degrees that's 0 squared no light comes through when we cross the Polaroids. So here's an example of computer screen of the LCD. The liquid crystal material um, liquid crystal display is very interesting material. If there's no voltage on it, the molecules actually twist the direction of polarization of the light that comes through. When we apply a voltage, and it doesn't take much voltage, it doesn't take much current, um, the molecules in here untwist and they no longer change the direction of polarization. Um, so the light comes through in the same orientation. When there's no voltage, we get a twisting of the direction of the polarization. So a small voltage can change the direction of polarization, and it can either allow light to come through or not allow light to come through. We have a Polaroid out here, and we're blocking the light now when there's a little voltage applied to the, uh, to the unit. Um, so there's what we've uh, applied now, some of our understanding of constructive interference and destructive interference. Our diffraction pattern understanding helps us see, determine, uh, understand why we can't see details uh, for objects that are close and far away. Uh, they're, too, they're unresolved. Their central max are overlapping. Thin film interference, soap bubbles, oil slicks. We get uh, certain colors bright, constructive interference because we have peak arriving with peak from the two reflected beams. And polarization, our light consists of electric and magnetic uh, fields um, that are oscillating and we can use materials to remove one direction of oscillation of the electric field, leaving us polarized light and allowing us to manipulate the amount of polarization and do studies of objects that uh, uh, reveal different characteristics when there is uh, uh, polarized light uh, impinging on it. So I hope that you're, you're reading ahead and uh, asking questions and pretty soon there'll be some uh, uh, sample problems to view.